So let's get to our first um, speaker today, our keynote speaker. Michael Clarkson is a caregiver. Not only is he a caregiver, he is an esteemed author. He wrote uh, the book, Quick Fixes for Everyday Fears, and uh, he's won 11 national and international awards, including a Pulitzer Prize nomination in journalism. And he's presently working on, a, on book projects uh, with Amazon that are going to be released this year, 2016. And what I would like you to do now, please, is give him an extremely loud, boisterous welcome that is worthy of the Oprah show. <laughs> Let's welcome Michael to the stage. Thank you, Stephen. You guys hear me okay? Yep. When I took this gig, Kidney Cancer can I thought it was 9 p.m. at night. <sighs> How are you guys? Uh, you look a little tired, but uh, anybody been skating over at the rink here? A lot of caregivers here, that's good. A lot of patients. Um, I am a caregiver. My wife, Jennifer, we've been married 40 years. She's had 25, and we count them now, major operations. Almost every part of her body. She's had uh, two uh, brain leaks through her nose, had those plugged, the first one didn't take. She's had both knees replaced twice. She's had, um, she found out about 10 years ago, she had a disorder called anti-mag. Her body produces too much protein and it destroys the nerve endings in her feet and her hands, so her, her hands are going to sleep and she's eventually gonna be in a wheelchair. But she is my hero. She is uh, a wonderful woman. She keeps me going and um, she says I've been to so many waiting rooms in hospitals and uh, doctor's office in the GTA, I should have this my own, make my own coffee table book of my favorite waiting rooms in the GTA. So anyway, that's my wife, Jennifer. We'll talk a little more about her as we go along. The stress and satisfaction of caregiving. You're gonna hear me talking about stress t this morning, my 15 minutes of fame. Most of the time when we talk about stress, it is distress, but there is such a thing as you stress which is good stress and the way we look at things when we're challenged. The use stress of caregiving, just a couple of notes on that. Being a part of a vital support system physically, psychologically, psychologically and emotionally, very important. We have an opportunity as caregivers to show someone how much we care about them. Great chance for us to learn something about ourselves and to develop our people resources. Take care of yourself emotionally, caregivers. I can't emphasize this enough. You are really a cancer patient as well, aren't you? I mean, you don't have the same symptoms, but you're going through the whole process with a patient. So look on yourself sometimes as a cancer patient as well. I think in my research, and I've written seven books about fear and stress, including, as Stephen said, by the way, Stephen, thanks for that nice introduction. It's hard to follow you, you're a good speaker, and that's my patronizing for the day. I've written a lot of books about stress and distress and use stress, and we have to watch as caregivers how we respond to what's happening to our patient. Because we're, I think, we're in a transition period. In general, human beings, we're in a transition period where we still have this body, this fight or flight body. When we feel, cha feel challenged, when we worry about our patient, our body goes through a whole series of changes and it's called fight or flight and we still haven't got this under control. That's the problem we have with stress today. I think all stress, all physical stress is what I call fear energy. In other words, in other words you're worried about perhaps a diagnosis, you're worried about going into an operation and you feel tense. Well, your body going into fight or flight, it's simple as that, fight or run away. And our body is like, it's like a really, it's a primal being. We have this computer brain, but we have this body which reacts to challenges, and we're not sure, the body's not sure what the challenge is, it just knows it wants to go into fight or flight, so we go through a whole series of hormonal changes. So we have to be careful what we worry about. In fact, usually at this time I do a little bit of a test, because um, when you're nervous, it's not too bad. Anybody understand why your body shakes like that when you're nervous? Physiological reason? It's because the blood is leaving my small muscles to go to my big muscles to fight or to run away. Simple as that, it's fight or flight. This is the problem we have with stress. We have to learn to 
uh, channel it properly or diffuse it. Friendly fire. Here's the problem with too much stress, too much worry. If we don't fight or run away, the testosterone, the hormones which are challenging and want to fight, don't know what to do. So they go inside us and it becomes like a friendly fire. When we, we worry too much, we get a lot of hormone cortisol, and if we get a cortisol drip, it can affect our human, uh, immune system. So we have to be very careful about how much we worry and what we worry about. Here's something in, unusual. When I started studying fear in 1988, um, I wrote this book about 100 fears we have today. And the number one fear we have today, believe it or not, is what other people think about us. There's even a name for it, allodoxophobia. Joggers speed up when other people are watching. Isn't that baseline stuff? There's nothing wrong with that. It's okay if we're motivated in a team setting to do better. We worry about what other people think. It's not okay if we worry too much and we want validation from other people. So we have to be careful about being motivated. But the jogger story is interesting and there's a lot of other, I'm sure there's a lot of other examples in your own life. I mean, if I wasn't uh, here today, I'd be probably with you people. I wouldn't be dressed like this. I'd probably be in my pajamas watching uh, cartoons or what, what's on Saturday morning? Donald Trump. We have our own cartoons. <laughs> I, had to get, I had to get Donald Trump in there. Um, we fear in three ways. What I just talked about was fight or flight or what I call emergency fear. But there are three ways we fear really. And one of them is what I just talked about, emergency fear or arousal. My wife says to me, Michael, in the last uh, 25 years, you talked too much about arousal. Get away from me, it's not your birthday. I'll let that just sink in for me. Worry. Worry is, uh, I think, more apropos in our everyday life than emergency fear. Although, as they say, when we have too much worry, it kicks in our fight or flight system and we get things like tension. Specific fears and phobias. Anybody, we're going to talk a little bit about the roots of fear. Anybody afraid of hummingbirds? Didn't think so. But there's somebody who's afraid of hummingbirds. When I was doing this research, um, I, had, I played a lot of sports and I had a broken finger and I went to a therapist and I asked her what her fears were and she said she was afraid of hummingbirds. I couldn't believe it. I said, uh, where did this come from? She says, I don't know. She says, well, all my sisters were afraid of hummingbirds too. And my mother, aha. They saw how their mother reacted to a hummingbird, so they all took on that fear of hummingbirds. Very good example and a very uh, pertinent thing to, for us to think about. It's how you react to things. Your kids, not only your kids, other people can take on your fears seeing how you react. And as caregivers, it is how you react, isn't it, to a lot of these challenges how the patient is going to respond. Also, um, don't judge too much if other people worry more than you do about the same thing. Not too long ago, maybe 15 years ago, scientists found what they call a worry gene in everyone. In other words, this little gene and we feel worrisome, we feel uh, challenges. This gene pumps out uh, serotonin. It's a very soothing hormone to help us calm down. But in some people, this worry gene is smaller than it is in other people. So as soon as I found that out, I stopped judging my mother-in-law. Because unfortunately, she worries about everything. Talking about worry and caregivers and patients, our original virtual world, we can talk about Facebook, we can talk about internet, we can talk as uh, Stephen did about Twitter. There's nothing more incredible than the computer we have on our head and shoulders. I think it is um, the place where we have our most fantastic achievements and also our downfalls. Out of that computer brain came EMC e squared, <coughs> Einstein's going to help me on this, and yet we can't forget what that person gossiped about us two weeks ago. We have to control our worries and our thoughts. Just to show you how much we think and worry in the course of a day, and caregivers, I'm sure you worry more than the average person, here's some examples of our daily routine. We touch our face 3,000 times a day, believe it or not. Can you read that one? Men speak 13,000 words a day and women speak 20,000 words a day. Ladies, do you have any comment on that? Sorry? Yes, 
uh, I was giving this talk in Montreal and a woman stood up and said, that's because we have to repeat everything. <laughs> Sixty-six thousand thoughts the average person has in the course of a day, and forty-four thousand of them are negative thoughts. In other words, they're worries. Big problem we have. Most of these forty-four thousand thoughts or worries are, I think, movie monsters. You ever go to a movie and your hair stands up on end when you when you see a monster on the screen? You know what that's from? That's from caveman times when we had more hair and it made us look bigger in a fight. So we're doing this over a movie. So you can see the problem we have, and when I talk about we're in a transition period between primal caveman days and computer days. We see too many things as threats, I think. That's the problem. 40% of these 44,000 thoughts are totally unjustified. 30% things occurred in the past. Yeah, I wish I had a better teacher, better parents. 22% miscellaneous and needless health concerns. Only 8% of these 44,000 worries are something we have control over, something we should be focusing on. So as soon as I realized that in my research, I just threw out a whole lot of garbage. What does it matter what my brother-in-law cares about the way I bring up my kids? There's just some things we shouldn't worry about. Whoops. <laughs> you know I had to get him in there. <laughs> this guy is a perfect example of fear. There's too much fear in our society. I'm not going to get political about this, but one of the major reasons he's on top in the Republican primaries is he knows how to deal with fear. And who's he got on his side? He's got the mainstream media on his side. Not necessarily the tabloids anymore. Here's another problem, I think. Since the O.J. Simpson trial, the mainstream media has become more tabloid. The problem is we've learned to trust people like Larry King. When Larry King, about 10 years ago uh, on CNN, talked about SARS in Toronto, I know SARS was a terrible thing. 23 people died. He calls it an epidemic. As soon as he called it an epidemic on CNN, what happened the next couple of days? The World Health Organization pulled Toronto as a destination for people. So that is the power of the mainstream media. And we've got a lot more tabloid. A guy like Donald Trump, you can see how it is, easy it is to play on people's fears more than their sensibilities. He's just gone right to the top of the charts. Glad I didn't have to do any more Rob Ford jokes. He's long gone. <laughs> Hypotheticalville, that's the problem. We live sometimes too much in a what if place. What if? What if that diagnosis turns out bad in a week? What if that operation doesn't turn out? Let's live for today. Today is Saturday, tomorrow is Sunday. Yes, prepare for Sunday, but we've got to live in Saturday. How do we deal with this healthy worry? That's what I call it, healthy worry. There is a healthy worry. There's a time to worry, and there's a time to throw all that other junk out. People who never worry actually never get anything done. People who worry too much never get anything done either. The trick is to focus on that 8% of things you can control. Set aside 15 minutes daily for healthy worry. Write worries down or network with other people. When you write your worries down and you look at them on paper, I think it gives you more perspective. Also, when you network with people and they, they, they give you their feedback, I think you can put your own worries in perspective more. Healthy worry is called planning. Healthy worry is called planning, but it's always followed up by action. One more thing I'd like to add, if you do feel overstressed and too worried, too anxious, exercise. Your body is asking for a physical response. So you, if you have time to give it a physical response, go out and run, then you'll come back and you'll feel more relaxed. Call it the testosterone blow off. Again, my book, um, The 100 Top Fears. In the old days, caveman had basically two or three fears. And his number one fear is not in that book anymore. It's not among the 100 fears. Anybody, any idea what that is? Fear of fire, yes. It's not only not in that book, we use fire to make our PowerPoints. We use fire to go to the moon. So there is hope for us to make this transition. Our growing number of fears, we have all kinds of new fears. Fear of the unknown is fairly, fairly common, actually, cavemen had that. Confrontation or conflict, fear of flying, of terrorism, of failure, fear of getting a compliment. That's got to be Canadian, right? <laughs> fear and stress in pets. I give my pet aspirin sometimes, my little dog. 
fear of downsizing, fear of retirement. Women, you have this fear of saying no. Caregivers have this. Women in particular, fear of saying no. I know men do a lot of the, the uh, share of housework, more than they ever did, but I think women still take on more responsibilities than men, and sometimes you just got to learn to say no. Patient and caregiver relationship. Communicate each other what each other can handle at the time. I think you know what I'm saying. Only communicate what each other can handle at a certain time. Share your feelings as well as thoughts. That's what I'm talking about today. Draw on one another's strengths. Patients allow caregivers to show their love. Okay, don't, don't hide everything inside. Don't tighten up. Allow your caregiver to show you their love through their efforts with you. Dealing with cancer worries. There's my wife, Jennifer. Tough-mindedness. Here's a tough-minded woman. When she was first diagnosed about 10 years ago in uh, Toronto with anti-mag, this uh, neurological disorder, we had two cars there. We didn't know the diagnosis was going to come that day. So we each drove a car there. We were working at different places. And uh, we found out it was a shock. She's got this incurable blood disorder, cancer-related blood disorder. I said, Jennifer, let's go home. Let the, let's go in my car go, no. She wanted to drive her own car home, and she did. An hour through traffic, she drove her own car home, just finding out that she'd been diagnosed with incurable blood disorder. Now, that's a tough woman. I don't think I could have done that. I don't think I could have done that then, but I think I can do it now, and that's because of my wife. I've learned a lot from her and what she's gone through and how she's reacted to it and her tough-mindedness. I think the tough-mindedness is the number one component for surviving cancer. Uh, by the way, she had a story in the Toronto Star. Anybody see that in the last year? It was in the life section. She talked actually about all the operations she's gone through. Uh, she's only had 22 operations then. She's had three since then. As a matter of fact, since then, uh, we were told she had uh, lymph node cancer, which was wrong. They wrongly diagnosed her. Uh, but we thought she had it for nine months on top of all this other stuff. The shadow was uh, over us. Anyway, uh, Jennifer had the story, and there's our pet Maggie. Okay, when I talk about tough-mindedness and then sensitive touch, a lot of times pets can help out with sensitive touch. When we go to bed at night, what does our dog Maggie do? It goes to the part of my wife's body which is hurting at the time, and the dog lays on that part. So animals are very sensitive to this. As humans, I think we need to uh, invigorate the, the feeling of touch. I was never a touchy-feely guy, but... I think as life went on, I found out the uh, significance of it. Just a simple touch uh, of a human hand can sometimes comfort you and help you through a crisis. Perspective, putting your uh, cancer in perspective. Showing up. I know you guys have a lot of fears about diagnosis, patients and caregivers, and going into operations. When you show up, life, I think, is 80% of life is showing up. When you show up to these things, you think to yourself, why did I worry about it for months and months and let my fight or flight system kick in and let my cortisol drip and, and hurt my immune system? By showing up, it seems to dissolve a lot of things. I th I've never, believe it or not, I've never had an operation in my life and I've never been sick, but I'm always afraid of the doctor and dentist. And when I sit in that dentist chair, I think to myself, what was I worried about for three or four months? So showing up is 80% of life. Here's the good news about society today in general. Our awareness of emotional intelligence and mental health issues is growing. We are more aware of mental health issues now, I think, than we ever were, and that's a very good thing. My parents never knew what the inner child was or defense mechanisms. I mean, they were as screwed up as we were. They just didn't know it. My point is, we're in, yes, we all have dysfunction, but mental dysfunction slightly, but we're in a position where we can do something about it. We're aware of it. We treat one another better than we did. Anybody like me who grew up in the 50s? There's this, uh, I don't know, uh, this image of the 1950s. What a great place. Let's go back and live there. No, I don't want to go back and live there. The 1950s, as far as I'm concerned, was a great place to live if you're a white guy with money. Not so much if you're a child, not so much if you're a woman or a minority. So I think we're a lot better, a lot further ahead than we were. Caregiving has become more than a cliche. Organizations like Kidney Cancer Canada are providing support, education, research, and making a difference for patients. And 
Learn to laugh at yourself. Uh, if it wasn't 9 o'clock in the morning uh, and we weren't ready to check out, usually at this point the women are throwing their room keys at me. <laughs> I think you guys know what laughter does. I mean, it's a tremendous thing when you're going through cancer and you're caregiving. It does a lot of things. That was from a toga party, by the way, on a, on a cruise. <laughs> Children laugh 400 times a day and adults laugh 17. What an indictment of our society. We've got to learn to laugh more than we do. Caregivers need to escape. I was talking to someone a couple of weeks ago from Kidney Cancer Canada, and uh, she said, you know, it's getting to me. This, this caregiving is getting to me. It feels like my life, it's always raining in my life. And I feel that way too. Sometimes I just got to get away. I built a fort in my backyard to get away. Now, it wasn't just for my wife and, and the, uh, the problems she's had, but I think as caregivers and patients, sometimes we need to get away. We can't do everything for, are you giving me the... Yep, we're almost done, Stephen. We can't do everything. We can't be 100%. And that basically is it. So I want to leave you with something. Um, but my wife and I, if uh, we have a particularly stressful day, uh, we sing the song together. Now, I had no formal training, Stephen, so give me a break on this. I'm going to sing a little song, and maybe it'll mean something to you. <clears throat> when you're worried and cannot sleep, just count your blessings instead of sheep, and you'll fall asleep counting your blessings. Thank you, and have a great forum.